This lecture is part of Berkeley Math 115, an introductory undergraduate course on number theory, and will be about the prime number theorem. So this is the um, fundamental theorem of analytic number theory, and what it says is the number of primes less than x, which is usually denoted by pi of x, is asymptotic to x over log of x. So, so this is the number of primes less than x. And asymptotic means the ratio tends to 1 as x tends to infinity. So um, if x is very large, say about a billion or so, it means the number of primes less than a billion is going to be very close to a billion over log of a billion, which means if you pick a random number between 1 and a billion, the chance of it being prime is about 1 over log of a billion. Um, the prime number theorem was first proved in about 1896 by Adamar and de la ballet Poussin. The, 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 they gave independent proofs of it, and they both used um, ideas originated by Bernard Riemann. Um, and what I'm going to do in the next le in this lecture and the next one is give a sort of rough sketch of the main ideas behind their proof. That there, there are several technical complications involving complex analysis that I'm not going to go through in detail. Um, it requires more complex analysis than this course really covers. Um, so in particular, in, in the more than a century since their proof was found, there have been several improvements. In particular, um, there were some improvements found by um, Newman and Don Zagier, which I'm going to in, in, incorporate. Um, there are several other proofs of this. Um, so Adamar and de la Valle Poussin's um, theorem used complex analysis. And if you're a number theorist, this is kind of annoying because you know results in number theory really should be proved just using number theory and not using complex numbers. Um, and for many years, it was an open question whether you could find an elementary proof. And in 1948, um, Selberg actually found um, an elementary proof of the prime number theorem. Um, his proof uses Selberg's identity, which is it's a sort of variation of what I call Selberg's identity in the previous lecture. Um, unfortunately, Selberg's proof was marred by a rather unfortunate priority dispute with, with Erdish. Um, what seems to have happened is that Selberg was giving some lectures on his work um, on finding an elementary proof just before he had I mean, it was after he had found Selberg's identity, but just before he had figured out how to use this to prove the um, prime number theorem. And someone in the audience passed notes of Selberg's lecture on to Erdish, who, um, um, and Erdish and Selberg both noticed that you could then prove, use Selberg's identity to prove the prime number theorem. So um, my feeling about this is that Selberg found a proof of the prime number theorem and Erdős found a rather minor variation of it using Selberg's ideas. So, so my own feeling is that Selberg is the person who should be credited with the proof. Um, anyway, um, so uh, in, the, in the first two lectures of this course, I mentioned you could find some easy upper and lower bounds for pi of x. So we have an upper bound. Um, um, you can find an upper bound for pi of x using the fact that the product over the primes between n and 2n is at most the binomial coefficient, which is at most 2 to the 2n. So this gives you an upper bound for pi of x, which if, if you work out the details, it looks like something like pi of x is at most about 2 times x over log of x. Um, on the other hand, you can find a lower bound um, again, here you use the product over um, all prime powers that are less than or equal to 2n or p is at least um, this binomial coefficient. And using this, you can find a lower bound on the number of primes, and you get a lower bound of the one pi x is greater than or equal to about a half times x over log of x. So if you look at these, it's quite easy to get the prime number theorem up to a factor of about 2, and with a bit more effort you can get this 2 down to a number slightly bigger than 1, and you can get this half up to a number slightly less than 1. Um, so, um, however, it turns out to be very difficult to get this 
this con to show that you can make this constant as close to one as you like, and the same for this constant, which is what the prime number theorem says. Um, so what I'll do is I'll um, recall the proof of the prime number theorem, uh, sketch the proof of the prime number theorem. So um, this uses the Riemann zeta function, zeta of s, which is 1 over 1 to the s plus 1 over 2 to the s and so on. And it was Riemann who discovered you could use the Riemann zeta function to estimate the number of primes less than um, x. Actually, you don't really use the Riemann zeta function. What you do is you use the log, uh, you, you take the log of the Riemann zeta function, then take the derivative of that, which is the, it's called the logarithmic derivative of the Riemann zeta function, and it's this function here. And as I mentioned in the previous lecture, um, this can be written as lambda 1 over 1 to the s plus lambda 2 over 2 to the s and so on, where lambda of p to the n is equal to the logarithm of p for all prime powers, and lambda n is 0 otherwise. So you can see that this, this lambda function is very nearly counting primes. It's counting primes except that you're not quite counting primes, you're counting prime powers, and you're also weighting things by a factor of log of p. Um, and the idea is you can estimate the, the following function. Um, you define psi of n to be um, lambda 1 plus lambda 2 and so on, all the way up to plus lambda of n. And um, so, for example, if we take psi of 10, this is equal to log of 2 plus log of 3 plus log of 2. Again, this comes because we're, uh, 4 is 2 squared plus um, log of 5 plus log of 7 plus log of 2 again, coming from 2 cubed, plus log of 3 coming from um, 3 squared. And if I've worked this out right, this, this number is about 7.83. And if you look at psi of 20, then, then you have to take this and you have to add log of 11 plus log of 13 plus log of 2 again. That comes from 2 to the 4 plus log of 17 plus log of 19. And if I've worked this out, this is about 19. Um, and the, the, the idea is to show that psi of n is roughly equal to n. More, more precisely, the ratio of psi of n and n should tend to 1 as n tends to infinity. And this will turn out to be more or less equivalent to the prime number theorem. Um, so um, here, are the, here are the steps of the proof of the prime number theorem. So um, step 1, zeta of s. First you show that zeta of s has no zeros with the real part of s um, greater than or equal to 1. So this is the key step. So you remember I mentioned every proof as a sort of key step plus a lot of routine details, and this is the key step, and once you've done that, well, calling the details routine is a... Um, they're rather more difficult than being completely routine, but but this this is really the central step of the prime number theorem. Um, so why should this be important? Well, um, Riemann showed that you can write pi of x um, as a sum over zeros of the Riemann zeta function. Actually, he's not, he didn't really sum over zeros of the Riemann zeta function. What he summed over was poles of zeta prime s over zeta of s. Um, but obviously, a zero zeta of s is a pole of zeta prime of s over, over s. So, so if, you look at, if you look at his proof, he, he was actually using the logarithmic derivative of the zeta function. And um, there's a pole at s equals 1, which gives you the main term, which, which is roughly x over log of x. Actually, it's, it's really something more complicated called the logarithmic integral of x, but we won't worry about that. x over log of x is good enough. Um, so, um, And then you get plus other terms um, coming from the other poles of zeta prime over zeta. Um, and suppose... Um, so the, these come from numbers s such that zeta of s is equal to zero. 
And suppose S is equal to sigma plus I T, where this is real and this is imaginary. This is sort of traditional notation. Why people use sigma plus I T, I don't know, but all number theorists do so. So this is the real part. And the size of the error depends on, 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 on the size of sigma. Um, the, the, the t sort of gives you a sort of oscillating contribution, which doesn't really matter too much. Um, now, if, if sigma was greater than 1, this, the, 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 these terms would be much bigger than x over log of x, so, so things would break down completely. Fortunately, it's easy to show the Riemann zeta function as no zeros bigger than s equals 1. If sigma is equal to 1, the terms are about equal to x over log of x in size, very roughly. And the trouble is, if you were having other error terms that were the same size as x over log of x, this would kind of mess up the idea that pi of x is approximately equal to x over log of x. So zeros with real part 1, if there were any, then the, 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 then the error terms would be as large as the... Um, as the main estimate for pi of x, and you wouldn't be able to give an asymptotic formula in the prime number theorem. And it turns out that zeros with sigma less than 1 are um, give you smaller error terms, and um, there's a bit of a complication because there might be an infinite number of terms with sigma slightly less than 1, but um, that, 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 that's a complication that we're going to kind of brush over. Um, so this obviously leads to the question, where exactly are the zeros? And the, the, the most notorious open question in mathematics is the Riemann hypothesis, which says that all the non-trivial zeros should have real part sigma actually equal to a half, which is in some sense the best possible. And this would give us the best possible estimates on, on the number of primes less than x. So that's the key step. Um, the second step is something called Newman's... Tauberian theorem. Um, now, this is a theorem from complex analysis, which says that if you've got a um, a reasonable, reasonably nice uh, function, and the integral from one to infinity of f of x x to the minus s dx converges for the real part of s greater than one, and um, if you can extend it. To a function that is holomorphic for um, the real part of s equal to 1, then the integral converges for s equals 1. So Tauberian theorems are kind of theorems that tell you that something actually does converge when, it, when, when you hope it will converge. Um, this theorem I'm going to skip the proof of because it involves some slight, well, involves some ideas from complex analysis. I'll try and put a link in the um, in the video description to a to a short proof of this by Zagier if you want to see the details. And then step three is we use Neumann's theorem to show that the integral from one to infinity of psi of x minus x over x squared. Um, dx, we show that this converges. And um, we're going to show it converges by um, using Newman's Tauberian theorem. And in order to use Newton's Tauberian theorem, we need that um, we need to know that something is actually holomorphic for the real part of s equal to 1. And this is where we use the fact that the Riemann zeta function has no zeros um, with real part 1, because if it had zeros, then the function zeta prime over zeta would not be holomorphic for um, this condition. So, 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 so this is where we use this is where we use step one. Um, so once we've proved this, um, the, the remaining steps are rather easy. So step four, um, we deduce from step three that psi of x is asymptotic to x. So, and um, going from step four to step five. So step five shows that. Um, pi of x is then asymptotic to x over um, log of x. So, so going from um, step 3 to step 4 and step 4 to step 5 are really rather easy. And the hard parts of this proof are steps 1 and steps 2. 
Um, so um, I just recall some facts about Dirichlet series. Um, if we've got a Dirichlet series A1 over 1 to the S plus A2 over 2 to the S and so on, then we can ask where does it converge? Um, well, if it converges for S equals S naught, some real number, then it also converges for S is greater than S zero. And more generally, it, it, it converges um, um, whenever the real part of S is greater than the real part of S zero. So what this means is that in the complex plane, we can find some, um, some vertical line here such that the series converges in this region here, and it does not converge in, um, to the left of this line. Um, we, we, we might also get um, the extreme cases where it converges for all complex numbers or doesn't converge for all complex numbers, but except in those cases, there's always some line such that, that, that the series converges whenever the, 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 the real part is to the right of this line, in other words, larger than this number, the, the, the real part of S0, and diverges to the left of it. Um, you notice this is actually sort of similar to power series. You remember that if you've got a power series, say centered at the origin, then there is you can find some circle such that the power series converges inside the circle and diverges outside the circle. And when you're on the circle, uh, maybe it converges, maybe it doesn't. It's kind of hard to tell. And, and again, the circle may be degenerate, it may be a single point in the power series might converge nowhere, or, or it might be sort of an infinite circle and the power series converges everywhere. So, so um, convergence of Dirichlet series is rather like convergence of power series, except that instead of converging inside a circle, it converges in a half plane. Um, by the way, uh, um, for power series, um, if, if a power, the, the place where a power series converges in a circle is, is the circle of convergence is much the same as the circle of absolute convergence. In other words, if a, if a, if a power series is absolutely convergence in an open disk, then it's actually convergent in a unit disk. For Dirichlet series, things are much slightly more complicated. For instance, if you take the series 1 over 1 to the s minus 1 over 2 to the s plus 1 over 3 to the s and so on, it converges provided the real part of s is greater than zero. But if you take the absolute value of its coefficients, you get 1 over 1 to the s plus 1 over 2 to the s and so on. And this converges whenever the real part of s is greater than 1. So the, the half plane of convergence is no longer the same as the half plane of absolute convergence. Um, the proofs of these statements about convergence are not that difficult, but I'm going to skip them on grounds they're complex analysis rather than number theory. Um, next, we need to know where are the zeros of the Riemann zeta function. So the Riemann zeta function is 1 over 1 to the s plus 1 over 2 to the s plus 1 over 3 to the s and so on. And you remember this can be written as an Euler product, product over, over all primes of 1 over 1 minus p to the minus s. And now we notice that zeta of s is non-zero if, first of all, all factors are non-zero, and secondly, the product converges to a non-zero um, value. Um, so, obviously, it's rather difficult to tell. Um, if you've got a function written as a sum of things, it's pretty hard to tell when it's zero. But if it's written as a product of things, this is a lot easier because this is obviously going to be something to do with with where, where, where the where the zeros of the product are. Well, provided the product converges, um, so uh, you, you, you know you, you you can get a product of things like one times a half times a third and so on, and all the terms of this product are non-zero, but um, if, if you take the product of all these, you're obviously going to get something zero. So it's not enough to check that the product converges. You've got to check that it converges to something non-zero. And an easy way to do this is to take its logarithm. So we, we look at the logarithm of the product over all primes of um, 1 minus p to the minus s. 
Um, since we're taking logs, we can, you know, they, they, they turn reciprocals into taking minus signs. So um, if this converges, so um, if, if this converges, um, well, so, so we can write this as a sum of um, logarithms of 1 minus p to the minus s. And if this sum converges to something, then the, 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 then, then the product is non-zero. Because um, if the sum converges to something finite, then the product will be exp of that finite thing, and exp of something finite is non-zero. So what we want to do is to study the convergence of this sum here. Um, and we know that logarithm of 1 minus p to the minus s is approximately um, um, p to the minus s in absolute value. So you remember log of 1 minus x um, uh, minus log of 1 minus x is x plus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 3. And if x is small, this will be approximately x. So we want to know... So we want to know if the sum of p to the minus s converges. And this converges if the real part of s is greater than 1. Um, you can see that fairly easily because here this is a sum over all primes. But if you take a sum over all um, integers, sum over n of 1 over n to the s, this converges if the real part of s is greater than 1. So if the sum over all integers converges, the sum over all primes converges. So what we conclude from this is that the Riemann zeta function is non-zero for s is greater than 1 because of the Euler product. And what we want is to know that zeta of s is non-zero for, um, so it should be the real part of s greater than 1, for the real part of s equals 1. So you can see this is right on the boundary of the region where we can prove it's non-zero. So what's going on is, um, so we, we, we've got the complex plane here. Here we've got the Riemann zeta function. And here we've got the line with the real part of s is equal to 1. And in this region here, there are no zeros because the product converges. Um, and what we want to know is, are there zeros here? So, we, so there are no zeros in this half plane, but we want to know whether or not there are zeros on the boundary. And this turns out to be you know, sort of very tricky to prove. Um, anyway, the, the other zeros, by the way, are in this line here. So this is called the critical line. So the, this is the line with real part of half. And it's known that there definitely are some zeros on this line. And there are also a few zeros of the Riemann zeta function at minus 2 and minus 4. And so and they're, they're called the trivial zeros. And everybody mostly ignores them. Um, so um, um, we were also like to know that the Riemann zeta function is actually defined for all complex numbers because the series for it only converges in this region so it's not even clear that it's defined for um, the real part being equal to one so how do we define the Riemann zeta function in, in in this region here well what we can do there's an easy way to do this what we can do is we can look at the series one over one to the s minus one over two to the s plus 1 over 3 to the s and so on. And now this converges for the real part of s is greater than 0. Um, if s is real, you can see it converges because it's just an alternating series. If s is complex, it takes a little bit more work to show that it converges, but again, I'm going to skip that. And what you notice is that this is equal to 1 over 1 to the s plus 1 over 2 to the s plus 1 over 3 to the s and so on which is um, minus 2 over times 1 over 2 to the s plus 1 over 4 to the s plus 1 over 6 to the s and so on, which is equal to zeta of s minus um, 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 minus 2 
zeta of s over 2 to the s. So we find that 1 minus 2 over 2 to the s times zeta of s um, is given by this series here, 1 over 1 to the s minus 1 over 2 to the s and so on. So this is defined for the real part of s is greater than 0. So this almost gives us a definition of the Riemann zeta function for s greater than 0, provided this thing here is non-zero. Well, this does actually have zeros. Um, it has zeros whenever um, 2 to the s minus 1 is equal to 1. And there are some points with real part s equals 1 where, 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 where this holds. So this doesn't quite define zeta of s for all um, numbers with real part equal to one because of the problem with this but then we can th 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 then we can do a um a different trick we can look at zeta of s minus three over three to the s times zeta of s um and do the same trick and show that this is also defined for real part of s greater than zero and now we just use the fact that um um 2 to the s minus 1 equals 1 and 2 and 3 to the s minus 1 equal 1. The only common solution is s equals 1. So um, the first definition shows that zeta of s is defined whenever 2 to the s minus 1 is not equal to 1 and real part of s is greater than 0. And this uh, variation using 3 instead of 2 gives the same value for that. And altogether this shows that zeta of s is defined for all numbers with real part s greater than 0, except for s equals 1. And for s equals 1, zeta of s really does become infinite. So that gives the analytic continuation of zeta of s to real part of s greater than 0. Um, by extending this argument, you can actually show that zeta of s can be defined for all complex s except for s equals 1, but we don't actually need that, so um, I'm going to omit it. Um, so that's a summary of the basic um, background for the um, proof of the prime number theorem. So what I'm going to do next lecture is to go through steps one to five in a little bit more detail um, and actually sort of sketch the proof of the prime number theorem.